we we were we were in, at a size where like you know we were three or four or five people whatever it was and it felt like we were just friends hanging out doing some work and then when we started growing it was like actually no we're not like there is an absolute power dynamic here you know there's an absolute hierarchy and and actually you need to set some boundaries you need and you need you boundaries really yeah. huh you need boundaries for the benefit of each participant yeah for also for the comfort of yeah. everyone you know yeah. like everyone yeah. everyone needs to feel because ultimately like you know there is a power dynamic and however much freely somebody feels that they can speak there are still kind of restrictions that you feel you know ultimately this is someone who is your you know your direct kind of line manager or your boss or whatever it is that however it is you want to call it and and i think it's important to acknowledge that and to not you know um to, to not to not kind of get to a place where you feel like oh you know we're just we're just friends doing you know fun things yeah yeah it's so in a way i think those yeah those boundaries are something that you learn i think along the way yeah um yeah. i guess with me like with teaching merve taught me a lot about that at the beginning mm. because she had a, a few years of experience teaching a diploma unit and yeah and uh and i think she she taught me a lot about like how we set boundaries with the students um but also i think it's what's really difficult is because you invest so much uh of your time and uh and you and there isn't you know there is a level of care to the students um that is above and beyond <laughs> it is i mean it is you know? Yeah. However much you try to kind of like you know uh, to to put to put to set a distance and you know and put a bound like set some boundaries. For human, right? Yeah, it's quite difficult because you yeah. become emotionally invested. Yeah, yeah. And I an mean, AA is like a small place, and you get a small group for like such an extensive period of time. It's like the amount of time that no one that you don't get in any other like educational setting. This kind of year long three terms of constant one-to-one -one. true it's really really special and like we're starting teaching uh at uh eth now in september well i mean we started already or we're preparing for it and to be honest with you i'm really i'm really scared about or not scared but like i i'm a bit concerned about how i can foster a relationship with a group of people um or with individuals um at one at a distance and two in a short time frame because you know how they structure their year is by kind of by terms so a bit similar to what, how CSM does it here so like you do one kind of unit per term and that's kind of you know and so in a way like you're working with a group of students let's say 20 group 20 students for three months or three and a half months whatever it is and it's like I'm I don't know what that's like I'm used to like spending a whole year with a group of 12 people and like and investing investing time and emotional energy and and allow, i think what that allows you to do is to also um i mean i think you know it'll be nice to talk to you like in a year's time and see what um how different that experience has been because yeah i'm sure there's going to be something quite uh beneficial from the shorter uh engagement yeah absolutely. Then i think it's the it's the ability to really wander around and to change ideas and to kind of drift between different things that this lo year long process allows you to do right yeah and and i think also like i suppose what what i'm a bit um unsure about and i'm curious to see how this will pan out is like you know in order to create an uh, or to foster an environment where um you as an educator and the learners um, both feel that they can be vulnerable and learn from each other is not something you can do by kind of, you know, uh, uh, making a, a bold statement at the beginning of the year or like, you know, putting together some like formal document on what, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the framework is or whatever. It's actually very much about like, spending time and 
listening to each other and getting to know each other so that you can understand each other and each other's boundaries and be able to to communicate with each other in uh in in you know uh in a non-hierarchical way and and i suppose in a way like that's something that um that i'm curious to see how that will pan out in a much shorter time frame um and at a distance i mean it's yeah yeah because for me teaching has always really been about that kind of you know that back and forth and um it's interesting you say that because um like i i did some work with uh, ruskin in oxford at oxford and the students there are so amazing like art students mm. very different to architecture students and so they they are very aware of you know um inclusion and kind of responsibility and cultural kind of things and they produce this document called shared learning agreement with mm. really like, really amazing document maybe i'll share it with you and they, oh, i'd love to see that yeah. yeah it's like they did it in a workshop with another artist i should I, sh I actually forgotten the name of the artist that's come up with this um methodology of producing this document but, uh, but it's really interesting because they spend a day or two or three in a workshop where they produce this document. But as you say, it is a document. And even, okay, I must say in the document, it does say this is a live document. This is what, is it, what is it called? What do they call it, Marco? Shared they call learning? It shared learning agreement. Because we do that at the AA um, within our unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we look at that document and we adjust it and agree to act on those terms or just have that at the back of our mind when we engage mm. with one another. But I think you're absolutely right when you say that, sure, you can have that conversation and you probably should have that conversation, but it's actually about being in the space together. Mm. And, you know, you can have a document, you can write things on the paper, but if you don't sit together and you, if you're not generous towards each other, like on a permanent basis, it doesn't really do anything, you know? It's just like some something you've written down and... And you need that time. So. Yeah. And actually like really embracing slowness, you know, like, you know, not, I think it's important, at least for us, it was always important at the beginning that like, we really take our time to like, you know, settle in and like get into um, a rhythm and, you know, and get into a project because it was, I think it was a really important kind of, it was a really important time to kind of, you know, to just, uh, to navigate new relationships, you know, and, and it's a, it's, it's a very personal thing, you know, the, the project that the student is working on, but also the, you know, the, the kind of engagement that they, you know, that they are getting, uh, with us. And yeah. And I think that's, that's absolutely key, but I, I, I also think like, uh, at least like, like for for me, I think a big part of it was not just, you know, um, about, you know, those kind of building, you know, building those relationships um, and, and breaking down some um, some of these boundaries, but also, you know, uh, build building new boundaries. Um, yeah. I think it was it was very much about like in, engaging with other knowledge practices, you know, so um really kind of uh, uh championing embodied experience um and and testimony and you know and 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 understanding how other people organize and come together and um and gather and congregate and i think that was really key mm -hmm. um that was absolutely key for you know for creating that kind of that kind of environment the new teaching you start at ETH, um, is that the with you, Paloma and Sana, is it more like a material cultures uh, project? Or Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the first time that me, Summer, and Paloma teach together. I've taught with Paloma before. Um, uh, we did a, a, a think tank at the, at the LSA, which was actually really great. Really, really enjoyed working together. Um, but yeah, we we're we're quite different as individuals, so I think that's kind of exciting for me. And in a way, I um, uh, I suppose 
we don't always agree with each other, which uh, which I think is really generative. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you get quite different uh, perspectives. So I think it would be really interesting to see what comes out of the next three months um, teaching together. I'm I'm kind of like in a way I'm kind of scared, but also quite excited because I I every time we enter in these new it's it's funny because like I have such an established relationship uh, with them um and uh obviously because you know we we've, we've been running a practice together for a few years um but in a way i feel like every time we start a new different project together um it's quite it's testing mm. and um and it's really kind of uh, a, a test of uh our compatibility or our relationships and uh, you, relationships. Don't wanna, you definitely don't want to say friendship because that's not uh, that's not the question here well no no it's i don't think that's what's being tested absolutely not and actually i think i i feel very very lucky and quite blessed um that i work with two really incredible people um and also i think you know we have we have worked on our relationship in the same way that you work on your relationship with your part, like with your kind of, with your lover or like your, your life partner or whatever. Um, and because, you know, ultimately I spend, I actually spend more time with them than I do with anybody else in my life. So um, it's quite, uh, it's a lot, you know, yeah. and they, we each get like, a, they get a, the spe a spectrum of, of me, you know, at my best, at my worst, um, and everything in between. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a really important uh, for us to be able to have these honest kind of conversations. It's of any relationship, right, isn't it? To, to, to be able to work through uh, all the different kind of situations. Uh, at least for us, I think like our politics of practice is really key. And uh, a key part of that is how we communicate with each other. Um, to try and untangle, you know, certain kind of uh, tensions or uh, um, triggers or whatever. And I think, you know, having these kind of really honest conversations is um, is really key. Uh, and I think like our kind of, it's like our notions of like care and custodial responsibility to each other Mm -hmm. um, is very much, I suppose, like reflected in um, in also like our relationship to building and to like designing and making. Um, and so I think all of these things very much like, you know, overlap. Yeah. Um, I think that's really interesting, the, the point you're making about um, the kind of collegial, um, collegial aspects of working within material cultures, which is the the, the practice that you run with uh, Paloma and Summer, that maybe within within resolving those um, relationships, there is also something discursive, like on a almost like theoretical level. So that's interesting. Maybe we could speak about an example or how how a conversation uh, that you've had that might have started as a kind of simple who does what or who's responsible for what turns into an interesting premise for a project or 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 an interesting premise for like architecture hmm. our growth and like you know d developing uh, or working on our relationship really kind of goes hand in hand with um uh with the growth and development of the practice mm -hmm. so i think very often when there is a when there is a shift in like the size or when there is a shift in like the structure or how we organize certain things is when you know when uh, a certain kind of um uh, dynamic uh is exposed or unfolds um and uh, and i think it is 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 it is in these moments um that an honest conversation uh um is 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 had but i mean i think that take also takes a lot of work because you know we all come with our with our baggage and um and because i think 
you know, design and architecture is a very kind of personal journey as well. Um, and, and very often feels like, you know, um, when somebody is uh, questioning something, it can feel like you are being uh, uh, questioned. And, and I think your instinct, or at least for me, like my instinct was always to get um, to, to be on the defensive. Um, and I feel like it takes a lot of unlearning to get to a place where you're like, actually, no, this is coming from a place of generosity. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is a really uh, powerful moment for us to, to build on something together. But right. also, if you're, if you're to have the same kind of approach, if, you, if you're to enact everything you learn or everything you've learned in how you want to deal with interpersonal relationships and collaborative practices, then, then it's quite challenging, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, I find what is quite challenging, especially in practice, is like how you then apply, how you apply that kind of worldview, let's say, um across uh across yeah or, or how you foster that kind of culture um in in the wider organization um and in the relationships that you have with people that are working with you ultimately we are still there it's still hierarchical you know we're not you know we're not a cooperative we're not a kind of employee owned organization and you know maybe in the future we may be because these are you know things that we're interested in and conversations I say that even those in environments have a hierarchy i think sometimes it's very um misleading to say that oh like we're employee on trust and now we're a flat structure that's absolutely not the case like if you look at any employee owned company in london which now most of the architectural practices are um, they're not flat structures. I mean, they still have exactly the same hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I suppose there is a different level of, um, uh, or different forms of accountability and agency in those kind of uh, structures. And I think in a way, um, yeah, I think in a way there's, in, in the way that we are organized, it's still very much, you know, that kind of pyramid structure there are ultimately, you know, we, we are the ones that are held accountable and we are the ones that feel perhaps that we have the most agency. Mm -hmm. um, At some point you said, you know, you kind of referred to our education that we went through because in a way I feel that we're always, and you were Me and you about, went through, you mean? Yes. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we are educators. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, are colleagues from both uh, student days, but also from uh, teaching days. And I think it's interesting to think about how we all respond to actually the, the experience that we've had. And mm. I don't necessarily now want to sort of start digging into our experience as students, but I think we're ultimately with how we, how we teach or how we engage in an educational environment, whether it's a school or whether it's a practice, actually, maybe we could all start talking about practice as educational environment. But in some way, I think what we do and how we behave as educators is also a response to our own education, right? Absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, my, I, nobody ever asked me how I felt when I was, uh, when I was, you know, when we were studying. And in a way, I think that is central to all the kind of the different spaces of learning that, that I occupy today. Mm -hmm. It's like, actually, how do you feel? You know, not what do you need to do or what you have to do, but actually like, how do you feel? Um, and really anchoring in that, I think, yeah, I think today, like knowledge production is very big part of my practice, whether it's, you know, in many different forms. So like, you know, in the academy or in, in the studio or in the office um, on the construction site or like, you know, even in the community, which is something I do a lot less of. But, you know, in, in the past, I used to spend most of my time doing community organizing. Um, and I think like all of these different spaces have very kind of different dynamics at play. Um, but I think the the root of everything in like 
how I engage in those spaces, for me at least, it's um, how always goes back to like how I can unlearn the manifestations of the system that I'm trying to escape. <laughs> um, and so like that's always, you know, that's always like uh, about, the, you know, the uh, the sing singularly kind of defined success at the expense of somebody else. Um, you know, displays of power or evaluation and certain kinds of metrics, um, mm. efficiency and speed. And in a way, we were talking about slowness earlier. And, and I think, you know, a big part of like embracing that slow process is because um, because it was always, you know, it's always about do, do, do and, mm. uh, and you know, deliver, produce. And the clock that? is ticking. Yeah, and the clock, yeah. So, yeah, so I think that's, for me, like, that's always been a key part of, you know, the kind of uh, pedagogic kind of approach, I suppose. Um, and I think, you know, we can talk, like, I think what's really interesting is about, like, the academy is, like, yeah, it's such a great space. And, um, you know, in a way, you have the kind of resources in that space to um to really explore certain themes or ideas or interests that you have that perhaps actually are quite difficult to do in other spaces um but there is you know there is an inherent power dynamic uh in that kind of environment and um you know the kind of you know qu qualifying or you know uh the idea of qualifying really exists uh, to classify, you know, and, and, uh, you know, uphold these, you know, these kind of these systems or, you know, structures um, that uh, we are trying to um, get away from. And so, and, you know, and that has very much, uh, or those systems of knowledge production are very exclusionary. And I think for me, like, that's why um, engaging in, in knowledge production in other spaces is really key and um and a lot of you know a lot of the kind of um uh a lot of that kind of engaged pedagogy that we were uh or, or that framework that we kind of you know tried to apply in um at the aa was very much actually something that um came from other spaces Mm -hmm. um, and how uh, we engage with people in other spaces um, and, you know, how we exchange knowledge in, in those other spaces. And so, yeah, sorry. Yeah. When you say community organizing, there's again something very generous about generosity is required in order to transfer knowledge, right? Mm. I mean, there is obviously knowledge can also be commodified and it is commodified, but mm -hmm. I think there is also something, there's always something generous, especially when it's done because of this kind of inherent social value of it. And so I wonder when, when you say community organizing, you, what, what do you mean? I think I, I, I was talking about uh, the work that I used to do with, uh, with, P with POA or Pride of Arabia um i that that was so, so that project started really and and uh and peaked when i was working um in a large practice and absolutely hated everything that i was doing um and the environment that i was in um and so i really tried to find you know um tried to find another space where mm -hmm. i could feel seen and understood um and so in a way like that project was very much um it was you know it was a it was a kind of it was like a it was a social network um and uh, and also a platform it was very much about knowledge uh production yeah um, as well and knowledge exchange so you know, it really, it centered queer people from the Swana region. So, you know, migrants uh, who are living in London um, and who are navigating their identities and 
um, and and you know nurturing or trying to uh, 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 trying to kind of foster a community um, that's uh, that's really um, uh, uh, believes in like you know a mutual interdependence. Um, and so in a way, like the, 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 that space was very much like a space for engaging in politics of care. Actually, we did a, we did a, a, um, a chat, a talk once, or we had a conversation once at the AA during COVID about, about, our, you know, about politics of care. Um, and, uh, resource sharing was key as well, you know, how, you know, how we can engage in solidarity economics, um, and knowledge production. And it was all in those kind of spaces that we held and built uh, for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, it's it's interesting. There are many ways to kind of talk about that project. Um, everyone will, everyone involved will uh, talk about different elements of it because I think it was key, like it was a real key kind of, uh, it was a, yeah, it was, it was a key part of like our survival at the time and also like, and for me, like my becoming, you know, like I, I just like, I, for the first time ever, I saw the possibilities that I never, ever felt, um, uh, felt that I could see. And for the first time ever, I, I began to, you know, I, I, I began to feel like, actually, no, hang on, I can belong, you know, like I, you know, I can feel I can under I can begin to understand like that sense of belonging in ways that I never perhaps was able to understand it. I think there's quite a few things in there. I think one thing is uh, one thing that I completely share with you is being in um, in an environment which isn't particularly stimulating, mm. and actually you having to create your own your own world, mm. right? And and then there is another thing. What is interesting is that the outlet was through a qu queer discourse mm. uh, in some way or another. And what I find in a lot of the conversations I'm having recently, and I particularly I was recently reading in preparation for this academic year and some other research I was doing, I was reading queer phen phenomenology mm -hmm. uh, of Sarah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, a really interesting way in which she takes a philosophy that I mm. actually really always enjoyed, which mm. is technology, and places it in a queer, queer understanding. So on the kind of topic of like, you know, theory, I, I like I had not engaged ever with, um, you know, with any or at least, you know, with 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 theory apart from architectural theory, which actually I really, really didn't enjoy when we were studying. Um, uh, and 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 I actually I think like there is a kind of a fundamental lack in knowledge actually on architectural theory because I feel like we I, f I don't know why but I I just like I the only thing I can remember from uh, when we were studying is like we you know we did with this this like year long course on like the um, Elgin Mar Elgin marbles and like that's all I can remember. Um, and I, yeah, so anyway, I'm, I'm going on a tangent now, but like, but I think like while I was, um, while I was working, uh, on, on POA, I had started to meet a lot of people, um, in the, in the community that are, you know, that are working, uh, as community organizers or that are, you know, doing all sorts of things. But some of these people that became actually like really close um uh you know people in my life to still today introduced me to a lot of um a lot of theory mm -hmm. um to which which began to get, give me like like Sarah Ahmad um like bell hooks um you know uh like uh, uh, I mean you know we can it said like you know a, a, a vast array <laughs> of key texts mm -hmm. um, that really uh, spoke to my identity or like my intersectional identities um, and and to the kind of world that we were trying to build, you know? Um, and and really like, it, it was, 
it was it was like for the it's like a bit like when we started learning how to draw mm -hmm. um in architecture school like i i i was just like it became like this incredible moment of um of like f finally finding words um and uh and reading texts incredible pieces of texts uh, and theory um that describes you know my my experience um and really unpacks it uh and and it was it was absolutely liberatory you know um but that's just one element of of you know of the kind of uh of of liberation i think there were many different kind of uh dimensions to it within that project um but i think maybe to kind of also relate it a bit to space um the the i think poa was or or was was kind of was was very much like or the community organizing that we were doing was uh i guess i maybe i i, I think of it as infrastructures and you know infrastructures because one it's uh, we hold you know you hold people up but also you are creating space like physical space um to hold each other up so it's not just you know it is it is about material physical space which i'll i'll talk about in in a moment but actually it's also kind of these immaterial infrastructures so work that's being done on an emotional and like psychic level of care which mm -hmm. in itself was so crucial and fundamental to the project mm -hmm. um and part of that is about like unlearning these kind of manifestations of the system that we that we talked about and so it wasn't it wasn't like it wasn't campaign work it was very much like creative work right so um and and it it was it it got to a point where it was no longer reactive you know we were no longer kind of reacting to you know the lack of representation or or whatever you know like all these kind of like classic things that um but it was reflective yeah and it was no it, yeah and it was about like you know what we understand what we need yeah and we don't need to feel like we don't need to fight for space in you know in mm -hmm. this world that actually we reject to begin with mm -hmm. and so you know we we are building our own infrastructures and our own systems to 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 function so like you know when there is a conflict we don't fall apart um and so you know and so the question was always like what are these architectures that we need to build for for this future um and you know what what are these spaces what are these economies what are these systems and so in a way like you know uh there was a lot of the, the i think i think we didn't really realize actually the importance of physical space until much further later in the in the project um and and then it became all we could talk about you know like the importance of having and the, the importance and the power of having physical space um uh, not as an asset but uh, as a security to be able to have the freedom right to operate um in ways that you wish to operate outside of the system is absolutely key and that very much ties into like conversations today about you know, access to land, um, access to resources, uh, you know, because if you have more permanent, culture, if you, yeah, agriculture. yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when you have permanent physical space, you're able to build, you know, uh, resilient movements, you're able to build um, resilient uh, organizations, because then you have the space to, you know, to breathe, to heal, to organize, to grow, you know, to grow food. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I think access to land is really key for, uh, um, in, yeah, in, at least it was, it was a, it is a really key part of that conversation. But it's also so, it's so obvious how it ties into the, the work that you do with material cultures, mm. right? Responding to a kind of material or like environmental crisis. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think it was very difficult for me at the beginning to to I always 
in a way, I, I'm very good at compartmentalizing. So really kind of like entering a space and that and encompassing like that being my entire world for the moment that I'm in it. Um, and so I think it took quite a long time to be able to bring um, the those conversations um, into um, into practice or into the the studio. Um, but yeah, actually, they're absolutely interconnected. Um, and the, you know, um, the, 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 the politics of how we do certain things and how we talk about certain things and also the kind of narratives that we, you know, or the narrative that we use to talk about the kind of work that we do. Um, yeah, it has a lot of kind of, um, uh, they, they, they speak to each other um in in um in a lot of ways because they share they share the notion of care uh-huh. they do yeah absolutely 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 yeah and 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 it's also reflective in you know to, to reference an earlier conversation we were having in in the way that we organize as a practice and you know and i think like organizing is a creative practice you know and and that very much comes from at least my you know my kind of experience with community organizing um but i think ultimately like it's you know there are it is a very different context you know like um and i i quite enjoy that tension like you know we are we are a practice we are engaging we are a service provider you know uh, although we have a profit and a not for profit arm you know it's still a very different set of circumstances and um and actually it's a very different economy that we are, um, that we, you know, that we are engaging with. Um, and so it's very, it, it, it was always quite difficult for me to be able to kind of, um, uh, you know, to bridge those two things together, but also to acknowledge that there is, uh, they are two very different worlds and, um, and not to be naive about uh, trying to apply certain or trying to use certain language that perhaps I would use to describe, you know, POA to, to describe the kind of work that we do or, you know, how we do certain things in the, in, in the studio. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think, you know, for like now, actually, this is the first time we're working on, on, on a project uh, in, in a kind of urban farm in North London um, uh, where we're engaging uh, with, uh, with community organizations. So, in a way we are you know we are coming in as um as a company or an organization and you know and and we're engaging with individuals and and communities um so there's a very different set of stakeholders that we're used to um and i think this is this is a really interest this it has been a really interesting journey so far to try and really establish um or rethink how how as an organization or uh, we can uh, engage in more uh, projects like this um so maybe just to give a bit of context we we ha- we we have a bit of funding or we want a bit of funding in order to uh, to deliver a project on this site and so in a way there is already an inherent power dynamic here where like we as an organization hold uh, um uh, or, or we, yeah, we we have access to the funds, and we release the funding in a way. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, mm-hmm. obviously there are funders that we have to kind of uh, that we are accountable to in different ways. But there, you know, there is there is already that kind of power dynamic of um, uh, in that kind of you know funding world mm-hmm. where uh, which we are, which you know we're you know we kind of we're trying to kind of. Um, understand and navigate to see how we can engage in projects like this in a more um, uh, equitable way uh, Mm -hmm. and also in a more transparent way and so you know part of the work that we're doing on that project is to kind of to design the you know a a a finance model um, that uh, that is very different from a finance model we would apply um, for a project with private uh, um, uh, clients um and so 
you know, and 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 I guess also, you know, there's an element of like participatory design in this project that's um that's also really interesting. Uh I think, you know, at least for me, um, and how we design that framework. So just in that example, George, um, so so you come together with uh with the urban uh the urban farm um and mm. you together sort of apply or you apply kind of no we 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 applied you, as, yeah. yeah we applied um obviously in in conversation with them um but ultimately uh we designed the, like we put together the narrative yes uh, uh um which you know you know in in itself is 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 also something we can unpack. yes yeah um and uh you know yeah so so there's no we yeah and then now we are engaging in um uh in in the project in real terms um so but yeah so like you know for me like something that i you know we were talking about participatory design like something that i learned from like for me this project is really queer actually something that i learned from like you know community organizing is that like you know in a hard way is that actually the outcome doesn't matter it's about it's about really the process um and how you engage with the process um and you know you don't really you the, the object at the end is almost kind of irrelevant actually um and and so in this way i you know it's it's difficult because like how you know we are talking about designing an object <laughs> um uh but also we are talking about designing a process um and so yeah so there is a bit that tension is like how do you let go of you know what that kind of object can look like yeah. um um it's so interesting and, because because basically what you're saying is that you're embodying both the architect in a traditional sense always sees that you know does a drawing and it mm. sees the kind of end before the beginning, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but then you're also questioning that narrative by having a completely different terms of engagement with with the person that's going to use it. It's a really interesting place to occupy, and it's a new place, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. At least for us and for me, like it's something quite new, I suppose. Trying to like, there is a lot of self reflection along every every milestone along the way, you know, like along the entire process, it's always about self-reflection and really questioning your instincts all the time. If your instinct is to do the, it this way because of like, I don't know, your experience or like what you've been taught or what you think, mm -hmm. whatever, however you've been, we've been wired or you've been wired, then you question it, you know? And I, I for me, like, that's really, that's really exciting. Like I just, I love sitting in a mess and trying to untangle it. Um, and yeah, and in a way, I think you don't get that with a traditional project. You know, with a traditional project, it's very much about like getting things done to get to the end. And so it sounds as if you, what you're also talking about, you're talking about in a way learning from places where we're not traditionally learning from. Mm. I'm thinking of this, uh, remind me the name of the lecture series that you, Merve and Bushra and Nana organized. Mm -hmm. What is it called? Uh, imagining, imagining Otherwise. Yes. What you're doing there, you're sort of tapping into all these different forms of creative practices and you're trying mm -hmm. to also learn. You know, I wonder whether you can reflect on maybe certain lessons or that is like a way of thinking that you haven't that you've learned through the process of of um being in dialogue with artists mm. designers yeah i think that's really that's really great i haven't really i haven't really reflected on that um that's really really interesting to think about that lecture series was really although it was it it you know it felt like a lot of kind of admin work and at yeah. times it was very frustrating um right. and actually i was very nervous i really don't enjoy 
um, speaking, and you know, we talked about this on the phone before this chat anyway, like I, I really don't enjoy speaking um, or engaging in these kind of public type events um, because yeah. I almost feel like there is an expectation for me to perform, yeah. you know, or to, you know, to kind of like, uh, to have a certain knowledge um and uh and and for me that's a bit triggering to be honest um and so and so i was i was very nervous at the beginning because i wasn't quite sure what to expect um uh but in a way i think it was really it was quite amazing like it always felt very i always for the first time in a in very long time in doing this sort of thing um I very much felt at home. Um, I felt very uh, safe and um, like the space was intentional. Um, and yeah, and in a way, I think perhaps the reason maybe why I felt that way is also because people, the people we invited really spoke from their personal experience and like were very kind of open and vulnerable and to me like that is very empowering as a when you're you know when you're in a public forum or whatever however you want to call it um and the people that you are in in that space are all have all let their guard down let's say and are just being very honest mm -hmm. that that was a very that was that's very powerful to me and that makes me feel very powerful as well um in, in not powerful in a kind of like domination type way, but powerful in a kind of like, you know, uh, uh, eman emancipatory type way, you know, like I just, I felt a lot of relief and, you know, and quite a lot of lightness. And so, yeah, so in a way, I think that for me, that was a really great, um, that was a really great, uh, yeah, a really great lecture, like a really great project. I felt exactly the same thing when I did that sort of thing for the first mm. time. And when you did it last year, I, I, I was really impressed. And I was like, and, and knowing exactly what you said, like the, the amount of effort that's put into it that mm -hmm. no one will ever see and acknowledge is, is astonishing. But it's also that thing that when you're there and you have a someone that is a very profound and insightful individual with you, I think what's beautiful is when you realize how much you can trust that person and how mm -hmm. much that person will carry this space and that mm -hmm. situation. And in effect, your role is so minor. And, and that, I think, to mm -hmm. me, that was quite a, quite a profound realization. And even in doing these conversations, it's the insightful nature of the person that I'm talking to that actually mm -hmm. holds the space. And also the fact that you're willing to talk and the, the fact that you're willing to share and the, the fact that you're willing to take us on a journey. It's something that, you know, I think we forget. Like when you just approach the space and when you just approach the situation, you're sometimes not aware of other person's generosity. And then when you, when you then encounter it, you're kind of really, it's really great. Um, yeah, no, I, I, absolutely agree and you know what we had uh, proposed for this year is um to speak to uh to really challenge like institutional spaces of learning um and knowledge exchange so very kind of relevant i think to this conversation that we've been having mm -hmm. um where we invite like you know uh creatives gardeners dancers you know healers and like really uh like really tap into like their creative practice and to kind of understand how you know their experience of joy pain you know love grief um um and like really are the kind of um uh are are it is what creates those generative yeah. of knowledge exchange you know and and those sites being you know I don't know, the, the kitchen or the garden or the dance studio or, you know, the community center or whatever. Um, I have to say like Imani's lecture was, or Imani's talk um, was quite like really uh, uh, touched me quite a lot. Like I think just her, just her performance was incredible. 
um, and felt like she was really speaking like from from within, like a very, very kind of deep core um, in a way that I had not experienced anyone recently speak. Um, and it felt very powerful. It felt a bit like, yeah, it 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 was it was a really powerful moment for me. And what was it about? What was what was the subject? She was um, she was looking at uh, she was talking about her project in Louisiana, um, and she was talking about uh, uh, black uh, burial grounds, um, and uh, plantations, and uh, the kind of work she was doing. I think she had started with forensic architecture but continued or maybe started before FA and then continued with FA and then left I can't quite remember what the kind of sequence of events was but she's doing her um her PhD now and yeah there was like you know intersection of like mapping and forensic work but also community organizing on the ground um embodied experience there was a bit of all of that and uh yeah it was just really incredible um and incredible in the sense that like the work itself was you know very revealing um and very informative um but also i think the way she spoke about it was yeah was really really powerful mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting that you you use this example. This connection between research and the outcome. Um, mm. Because in a way, we're always in some way or another presented with an outcome. Mm. I think if we bring this conversation back to, to material cultures, I think a very important aspect of the work is the balance between research and outcome and I think maybe it would be interesting to maybe explore that a little bit more and mm -hmm. um, this you were mentioning how you're very good at compartmentalizing things but I think I think this is almost like a way of uncompartmentalizing things because mm. sometimes you're the project requires research but then sometimes research requires project right so so how do you how do you navigate that uh, kind mm. of escape? Yeah. Um, it's a tricky one because in a way, like all architects say that, you know, every project undergoes some level of research. Um, but actually very often it's just analysis in a way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I guess, I guess it depends, in a way it depends on the output. You know, like we have done, you know, we we have done some research to kind of uh, that, you know, we have a kind of, um, uh, yeah, we've, we've done we've done work that is around kind of material mapping. Um, and so, you know, um, uh, like really understanding a kind of a uh, um, what is available um, in, in at close proximity to a particular site. Um, or even uh, what uh, what are the potentials um, from a particular landscape to um, to facilitate the the production of certain uh, materials for uh, for building? Um, so you know there is a lot of it is uh, there is a lot of kind of you know of, of mapping in that sense. Um, also you know around like circularity as well. Um, uh very often i mean now more often actually they kind of very much overlap with a building project um but 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 very often you have you know the output being a report um and then the the building project that is going down a more traditional route um of like you know let's say the reba stages has a very short period in which we do a very kind of superficial um, analysis uh, of uh, what's available at close proximity to the site um, and then we work with that um, so I think where they kind of really uh, um, overlap uh, 
um, is, I mean, although it's becoming more common with some of these newer projects that we're working on now in the project in the office, which is really exciting. Um, but uh, but I think in in some of the education work that uh, uh, particularly Summer and Paloma were doing at CSM, um, and the kind of final output being, you know, a kind of a uh, some kind of structure. Um, that yeah, I think in in that context, it kind of uh, manifested in its full form, and so it's difficult because in practice, I think there are so many real life parameters mm -hmm. that you have to work with. One of which is also like you know, uh, making sure that you you know are you can survive as a business and you know continue to support your team. So you know, very often you have to compromise um, on you know on some of the on your approach uh, on some projects. Um, but yeah, it, I think it, it really depends on like how the project starts and who the client is, um, uh, you know, what kind of methodology is applied. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you, when you develop systems, do those new, new systems, let's say of, um, like building methods or construction methods or, or materials that are used. Are those done for projects or are they done as a kind of separate process of investigation that are then applied to specific projects? Again, it depends on the funding. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's also key. You know, that kind of research takes a lot of resource. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, there was uh, one, there is one project, uh, which is a house that we're working on which uh, we are hoping to apply um, some of the, uh, I don't know if you, if you saw this at all, but like we had presented at the building center, um, these uh, prefab um, or prefabricated um, vertical uh, thatched panels um, as cladding. Yeah. yeah. And so we have been lucky enough to develop this system um, through cultural projects um, and are applying it um uh on on a on a kind of traditional architectural project and so in a way it's a very fine balance of like how how you develop a system um uh, or how you fund the development of a system and when you can then apply it and at what point you know who takes the risk at what point uh, along the way so in a way i think um you know, for example, that uh, the th the thatching um, uh, the yeah the 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 the, st the straw panels that we presented um, uh, at Homegrown um, has been developed now in two or three different iterations, mm -hmm. um, and and it has been developed in two or three iterations specifically through cultural projects, some of which are not yet complete. That's why. Um, I can't necessarily share, you know, what that kind of uh, final outcome is, but what has been really amazing is that these two things aligned at the same time, you know, um, but you there... also, I could also see your students at the AA, like tapping stuff. So... They were so excited to be honest with you. They didn't make anything all year. And so in a way, any opportunity along the year for them to like, pick something up and make it. Were they <laughs> making something, something with... for the exhibition? They did. They did make something for the, yeah, they did make something for the exhibition. But I think it was, I mean, I, I, quite a few of them now are at Koshirakura. So, oh, yeah, yeah like, amazing. I don't know, like something like four or five of them. It's it's wow. kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, I think it's because we deprived them of making. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think like, you know, research is like a really interesting one uh is you know especially if like for Mervy and I when we were teaching as well like you know to it was also quite difficult very often to like present research methodology as proposition mm -hmm. um there's just like so much pressure on like you know de defining proposition through object um yeah through an object at especially at you know at the as and I'm sure in many other schools as well um but like we were always quite interested in like how we can develop, like how the what methodology the students develop as a research methodology, and constantly throughout the year we will always talk about like okay how are you defining like how do you describe that methodology, you know like 
some things that you are doing instinctively without necessarily like being conscious of it are actually very much part of your practice and um and very much part of your method and i think you know we have to acknowledge it you know um and so yeah so i think that's uh that that's that was always quite an exciting um that was always quite a really exciting part of the conversation for me and and for Mervy, I, I think as well yeah. uh, is to really be able to describe what that is um yeah because i think also like there's something that can be really revealing in um in in describing or coming up with a methodology that can be quite amazing more more amazing and maybe more kind of transformative than an object yeah you know or a building or whatever however you want to call it well <laughs> it's training or, or devising a process and so i think we've now like fallen back into the uh, education but i think if we ju just just for like somehow try to kind of escape back into practice yes sorry i no, no, no. But I mean, it's it's my fault, but it's not also anyone's fault. It's, it's, I think it, it's an interesting way to actually uh, draw a full circle. So, so when you're talking now about methodologies and processes, can this also be a product of an architectural practice? Absolutely, yeah. And in a way, like very often when we produce our reports, it's the methodology that we use to produce a particular outcome. But I think what's been interesting to observe in the evolution of material cultures is to look at different ways in which you tackle the the project or like what a project is. And, you know, you've produced the book, you've done exhibitions, you've produced uh, uh, like collaboratively a film. So that there's different kinds of outputs that you generate. And I just wonder how you think about that. And 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 there's also buildings, right? Which are also you could also put them in the same line of outputs. And um, so I just want to explore a little bit how you mm. think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose they are they are different things. They kind of serve different purposes in a way, like I think, you know, what story is being told and who your audience is really dictate what that what that output is. Um and I I think in a way, I think it's in a way like it's important to have that versatility almost to like be able to, um, to shift gear and like, you know, and tell the same story, but in a different way, using a different lens um, in order to reach a different audience um, or in order to instigate a different kind of conversation. Um and so, yeah, so in a way, like when we present our work, I think we are very selective about what we are presenting um, because, you know, it will speak to a particular audience in a particular way. Um, and I think that's, yeah, I think that's that's key. But also, to be honest with you, it's just more, it's also really more exciting, like to be doing, um, you know, to think about many different types of outputs. Like, for example, when you made the films for this exhibition, Homegrown, we collaborated with about five or six different people. We collaborated with somebody that did the voiceover. We collaborated with um, a sound designer. We collaborated with uh, an editor, um, uh, a script editor. Like there's so many, it's, I think those kind of moments where, you know, where you're able to bring together creative practitioners in order to produce something, I think that is really rich, um, and I think, I think to be able to, I think yeah, using different mediums is is key to be able to kind of get um, different people to, you know, to help tell the story in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and also it's just like it's a it's it's interesting to reflect on like how what that what that process was like you know like when you were when we were working on the book we collaborated uh with uh with a co-author and we we collaborated with um uh with a photographer and like those dynamics were very particular and that really you know that those sets uh, those relationships you know went through a a really particular uh uh process 
which are very different from when you are collaborating with, you know, um, structural engineer and a contractor. Um, and in a way you really, sh you have to kind of shift the way that you, um, you think about collaboration and there are many different parameters at play and like the language that you speak. I mean, you know, language that you speak. Yeah. And in a way, like it's in the same way I was thinking yeah, yesterday, I was speaking to a, to a 16 year old, um, about, uh, architecture, stuff like that. Um, cause they were interested in doing architecture and I found myself like using like, like, like kind of stepping out of my body and listening to myself speaking to this individual. And like, and I was looking at myself going like, why are you using these words? Like, well, who, like, like what, it, what if you're trying to make a, like, uh, put a point, like make, make a point here. Like it's really not coming across, you know, like you are using like, really unnecessary heavy like maybe academic language to describe something to a 16 year old like um you know or even like whatever uh emotional growth you've been through like that's it's really a different like you if you're trying to tell this story to a 16 year old you have to think through a very different you have to think think of it in a very different way and so it's the same thing it's like you know in an exhibition when you collaborate with people you're thinking about it in a very different way you're communicating with an audience in a very different way yeah and like to be honest with you i think very often like 80 percent of the work that we do is storytelling it's like you know how how you tell a convincing story to